Uh, so I think we are learning a little bit on how to do these exercises. First of all, there is no time to actually solve three exercises. You should consider it a success if you can understand the exercises. And uh, it's, I think we're gonna organize ourselves into, I think Mathieu already did this maybe, uh, so that every room, breakout room gets a teaching assistant who like a, a human assistant, not a proof assistant, a human proof assistant who can then maybe moderate a little bit, pick one of the examples to do it together. But as I said, already just discussing the problems without solving them is okay. Okay. Um, so yes, so uh, also I was discussing this with Egbert in the common room um, during the break. It really is, you know, some homotopy type theory is kind of an, it's, it's not easy to learn. It's, it's maybe as difficult as category theory when you first see it. You have to do every detail. You don't have a little, you know, otherwise you feel lost. You don't have a, uh, an overview of what's going on and then it just takes time. Okay, anyhow, let's now go to the next part which is called homotopy levels. Now this is important because it reveals a further structure of types um, that is not uh, visible at first sight. It starts with a very simple idea, namely that we can make paths between paths because the path space is a space. So for instance, you have what you would normally call dimension zero, which is points, and then we have paths between points. But then if I have two parallel paths, so if P and Q are paths from S and T or to T, I can consider the space of paths from P to Q. And these alphas, they would be kind of like homotopies, a little bit like homotopies in, 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 in category theory, uh, in topology, um, or two cells in, in category theory, that sort of thing. And you can keep going, right? You can then have paths between paths, between paths, between paths, and so on. And a question that arises is what if anything can be said about the structure? Well, first of all, the structure of just paths, but then also of these higher structures. And the first thing we're going to look at is what happens if some of these collapse? That is to say, if you know that maybe at dimension two and up, nothing interesting is going on. So the first task that we have is to say, how do you say that nothing interesting is going on? So, uh, Let's try to first just collapse the entire type. So everything, so that we want to say it's totally trivial, okay? So here's how we say it. It's contractibility. So say that a type A is contractible, written as this, is counter A, here it is. So I'm defining, what am I defining? I'm defining a dependent type on A, right? Because I'm mapping a, uh, sorry, I'm mapping a dependent. No, I'm not even doing that. For any type A, I'm mapping, I'm defining another type. So it's like a map from universe to universe. Uh, the question was there, do paths behave like an infinity category? Paths behave like infinity groupoids, yes. In general, yes, that's what's going on. And uh, where do you look at this? Peter Lumsden's pieces and who was it? Somebody in chat can tell us there are these formal statements saying that you can actually, Lumsdane and Garner, there you go. Uh, thank you, Egbert. Uh, they have a paper uh, explaining in what sense this is actually like technically the case. Also Benno, but I think it's, yeah, okay. So several people, people, Benno Vandenberg as well. Let's look at contractibility. What is this saying, okay? So the way you read this is you say, a type is contractible if what? If this thing here has a point. Okay, what is a point of this? Well, this is a dependent sum because it's a dependent sum. Uh, let me pick a good color. Red is a bit too aggressive, maybe blue. Because this is a dependent sum, there's going to have it's going to have a point here, and then there's and, and then there's going to be an element of this, which is some sort of a function. You see? So what do these things do? So it will be a pair. It's a point C and a function H is an element of this type. C is in A, we call it the center of contraction. It's, we're going to, we're going to say that everything contracts to C. And what is H? H says for every point Y in A, I give you a path from X to Y. 
I think my picture is backwards. Yes, my picture is backwards. The way I wrote it from X to Y, it should be all like this. They go this way, but this is inessential because we can invert paths. Um, so a type is contractible. If there is a point C in type in A, which is called the center of contraction and a map, which for every point Y gives me a path from C to Y. Now at first sight, this looks like what I'm saying is that A is path connected. It looks like that, right? But first of all, it's not quite path connected because in topology path connect, the empty space is path connected in topology. So it's not quite that, depending on maybe on your definition of connectedness. Um, and um, there is another important bit is that the way to read this is that H is really telling you that the identity is null homotopic because H is saying that, you see this here, if you take the constant map on C, what is the, con what is the constant map C? It's the map which takes any X to C. Yes, that's what constant map is. So this C here is just const C applied to X. And this thing is just X. So you can read this H is saying for every X, we have a path from const C X to identity A and X. And now it's looking more like it's saying that there are pointwise paths from the constant map to the identity. So it really is about contractibility. We will get to connectedness later. So this is about contractibility. So that's how you say that the space is contractible. It just more or less is saying up to paths, it has a single point. That's, that's, that, that's a, the way to understand it. So you might think that the empty space is somehow more fundamental, no. The, the, the spaces which essentially up to homotopy have a single point are more fundamental. Everything will collapse. There is no interesting thing regarding, uh, no interesting st structure on the points. So what's an example of a contractible type? Well, hopefully the unit type should be contractible. So how do you prove that a type is contractible? You have to produce a center and then you have to produce the map H. So the center, we will take the only element of one is the center. Now, the next thing we need is we need to, for every element X of one, we need to produce a path like this. There will be different ways of doing this, um, but uh, because we said that the unit, so in, in, in the unit type, all elements, are, all points are equal. So you see here I have the unit, here I have has, because they are judgmentally equal, then in fact, I can just use the identity path all the time. So. I have here, I have this, and I say, given any point X in my one point type, I actually know that these two are the, literally the same point. They're judgmentally equal. So I can just use the identity path all the time. So this is why one is contractible. This is a nice exercise to try to do in the proof assistant. Tomorrow, there will be different ways to do this. So proof assistant might actually, uh, probably it will just reduce this it will say, well, you don't have to do it for every X. You only need to do it for the unit. And then you will say, well, but for the unit, I just use the identity path because there will be an induction principle for one. Okay, so it's good to know that the unit is contractible. Now, this is how you say that everything collapses. Um, one of the exercises will show that if you have a contractible type, then its identity type is also contractible. So contractible means has precisely one point up to homotopy. So now we're going to do it for high levels. And for historic reasons, we're going to start counting at minus two. So this minus two came up. I don't know, is it, was it, was it Mike Schulman? I think he argued successfully that we should start counting at minus two. We start counting at minus two so that we catch up at zero. So that zero means dimension zero, which means points. So let's have a look. So for every integer n greater than or equal to minus two, we define what it means for a type to be an n type. And the idea is that we want everything dimension n and up to collapse. So first we start at minus two and we say a minus two type is just a contractible type. So when completely everything collapses, then we say that it's a minus two type. And then here's how we go Here's how we make an uh, inductive step. 
a type A is an n plus i n plus one type if its identity types are n types. So a type is an n plus one type if its identity types are n types. Here's a little fact which I'm not going to do that if something is an n type, then it's also an n plus one type. So if something collapses, as soon as level n will collapse, as soon as level n collapses, all the high levels will collapse. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Let's look at examples. The best thing we can do to understand the definition like this is to check uh, to check now what does it mean for something to be a minus one type? What does it mean for it to be a zero type? What is a one type? Let's try to understand what these things are doing. Okay, so some special cases of interest. For minus one types, these are called propositions. Uh, what would it say? Okay, so um, here's an equivalent formulation. So maybe I'll just do the equivalent formulation. This is like a, going to be a little theorem in Egbert's book or in Hot book, which is going to show that if you unfold this official definition of minus one type here, so for all x, y, the space of uh, paths is contractible, that that's going to be the same thing as this somewhat easier definition, which is easier to, to understand. So let's try to understand it. Minus types are called propositions, and they say the following. For all x, y in A, x equals y. So this is just saying all points are equal. Doesn't that mean that the type is contractible? No, it could be empty. The empty type has the property that all types are, that all points are equal. Okay, the fact above, you mean this one here? This is hot book, hot book 12.43. Really? Egbert's book. Oh, well, hot. No, Egbert's book. 12 seems a little late in the book, hot book for such a fact. Okay. So uh, let's see. Minus types, minus one types are types. The way to read this is has at most one, one way to read this is has at most one point. If you have any points, whatever they are, but maybe you don't have any, then they're equal. Um, examples of this are the empty type and the singleton type, the unit. And uh, it's a more useful notion that you might think, and it's called propositions, because one way to understand these is as uh, truth values, as values uh, that uh, logical statements receive. You normally think of a logical statement as being false or being true, and you don't think of it as being true in many ways. If, you, if, we, if we thought about a logical statement, a fact of, of that something is the case, if, if we said, okay, but something can be the case in many ways, then that would be, that's not usual. Usually you just say, well, it's the case and that's it. There is no further discussion. So what this, this is saying is that um, types which have at most one point, are like logical statements. And so if a type A, which is a proposition, if it has a point, then it's then we think of it as being true. And if it doesn't have any points, then we think of it as being false. So zero is going to be our notion of falsity. This is the space that represents the truth value false. And this is the space that represents the truth value true. And the reason that this one is true is that it has a point. And the reason that this one is false is that it doesn't have a point. That's, that's the way we think. Okay, next we have zero types. These we call sets. And after some work, and there is going to be a theorem in Egbert's book, um, this is an equivalent formulation of something being a zero type. It's here. This one now says any it see earlier it said any two points are equal. So this one says any two points are equal. This one says any two comparable paths are equal. So given any points x and y and giving any p and q from x to y. So p and q are both of the same type. They are parallel paths. We can compare them, they're equal. So types which satisfy this, 
they they are going to collapse everything above zero, dimension zero. So that means they don't have any interesting identity paths, identity types. The identity types are boring because all paths are equal uh, in the sense that paths are equal whenever you can compare them, whenever it makes sense to say that they're equal. Um, so there's interesting dimension zero, which is points, but there is no further interesting thing going on at the level of paths or paths of paths, nothing is interesting is going there. Um, then we have a question. Uh, so to be true is to have a point and all the ways it's true are equivalent, asked by Violetta. That is a good question. There are, two under, there are at least two understandings, mappings of logic into type theory. There is something called propositions as types, where you think of a proposition, a logical statement, as having many possibilities. So let's take an example. There exists a prime, there exists a prime number larger than 100, okay? There would be two ways to understand this. The first way would be what is called proof relevant way, which is when we say, where we think that there exists a prime number larger than 100, that there are many ways in which it is true, namely, the different primes larger than 100 will all give me different ways in which this statement is true. That's called the proof relevant understanding of a logical statement like that. The, the other one that I spoke of, which is where you focus just on what the, whether it's true, but not why it's true or how it's true, is the one where you would insist that it must be a proposition. And then you would say, okay, the important bit is that we know that there exists a prime number but we don't want to distinguish between the different ways that, that, that uh, the different proofs that there exists a prime number larger than 100. So there are two ways to do this. And I was here saying one way to do it is you see that there's just, that there is a point and they must all be equal. Uh, Warwick, is there any way in HOT to distinguish the unit disk in any dimension from the singleton type? Uh, yeah, you could start by asking whether you can distinguish the uh, closed interval from the singleton type. And the answer is they will be equivalent as they should be because they're homotopically equivalent, but there will be ways to distinguish them because of judgmental equality. Okay, is there an example of a set in usual sense, but not a set in the new sense? Uh, that's Elif. Uh, you should think of sets in the usual sense as they will always be like, they will always be sets in our sense. There is a very close correspondence with the, what you would normally think of a set and what we are defining to be a set. So that's for in the first, in, in, you know, uh, if you're in the first approximation, just think that that's what we're trying to capture. That's the intuition we're trying to capture. As suspect, okay, thanks. Okay, somebody dragged in inaccessible cardinals. We don't have to do that. Okay, here. Um, what, uh, so where were we? Here we were, zero sets. So what are examples of zero sets? Uh, all the previous ones, but now also Booleans, natural numbers. Later on, once we have extension, function extensionality, you can add things like nat functions from natural numbers to natural numbers. And then you can open the book and all these, the books are going to have theorems which say, you know, if, if something is an n-type, then something else is an n-type. n-types are closed under this operation. n-types are closed under that, under that operation. Um, so uh, there is now going to be a whole theory of n-types and what they're closed under. Okay. Uh, what are one-types? Well, one-types is what you would call a groupoid. So a groupoid is a special kind of category where every where every morphism is invertible. Well, that's because you would think of a one type as uh, the points are the objects of the groupoid and the paths are the morphisms of the groupoid and every path can be inverted. So we are going to get a groupoid, um, but there won't be any interesting two cells, but I'm not going to go into this, but you can keep going here and then you have two groupoids. And as somebody already said in the chat asked, well, in general, do we have infinity group weights? Yeah, we kind of have infinity group weights and you can make this per precise. Now, why is, this, why is this stuff relevant? So one reason that it's relevant is that it allows us to talk about a very important mathematical concept, which I think in ordinary mathematical education is maybe not, it, it's emphasized, 
but here it really lives a very rich life in, in, in ordinary mathematics we're kind of have to stop at one level one with we can't really mix these things and here it's in here here it gives a very nice uh, explanation of what is going on so in general if you have a dependent type on a you can think of this in general as a structure on a because for every point in uh, for every point of a you get some additional information in the fiber over a so you can think of that as a kind of a structure and so then we say that we say that a dependent type like this we say it's a property if it maps into propositions that is to say for every x in a the fiber at x is a proposition what does this say well if i draw a picture this is saying that when i have an a here and then i have p if i look at any okay so i need to draw a slightly different picture let me draw it like this so here I have my A and I'm going to draw a disconnected A so that the experts don't scream at e, me. And now if you look at any anything up here, then here you will see P of X. Maybe here you will see P of Y. And when this thing here is always a proposition, so you can have one point or maybe you don't have any points. Maybe P of Z is empty. There's nothing in it, okay? So when this happens that everywhere it's like that, then, uh, then we say that P is a property and it's understood why we think of this as a property because for every X, it's either saying succeeding, it's telling you, yeah, yeah, the property holds at X or here at Z where it's empty, it's saying, no, no, at P of Z, it's not hold, it, that doesn't hold. So it's just a, like a, it's a sort of a, a yes, no thing, right? It's not, oh, you know, here's, some complicated way like here's a here's a local coordinate system and there could be many you know that would be a structure so what are some examples of this well let's see uh if i'm not mistaken the circle is not a set uh yep uh but to uh, know that you need a little bit you already need univalence okay so let's see uh what are some examples let's take this one uh what let's write down what is the structure of a monoid on a set M? So if I want to have a monoid whose carrier is M, how do I write that in type theory? I say, well, I want a binary operation on S and I want an element E. Uh, now I have to decide whether it's S or M. It's supposed to be S. There we go. Such that, and this is associativity here. See, this is associativity. And this is unit law. This is two unit laws. Okay. So for any S, there will be, in general, when I have an S, there will be many such possibilities. A given carrier set S, a given carrier set S can be equipped with lots of such structures. So monoid is going to be structure. Okay. But then you say, okay, let's extend this. Suppose I have a monoid and I want to equip the monoid with the structure of a group. Okay, so if I already have a monoid, here's my monoid. This is the carrier set, multiplication, unit, associativity, unit laws, alpha and beta are unit laws. Everything gets a name. So in ordinary mathematics, usually you don't get to name the element which says that something that associativity holds, but we do now in type theory. Um, so here's the structure of a monoid on S. And now what does it mean that we have an additional structure that it's a group? Well, we also need the inverse. So we say, okay, we also want the inverse. And then here are, here's the axiom for the inverse that if you compose X with the inverse of X, you get the identity and the other way around. Now, as it turns out, now you could prove, okay? This is, this is something you can prove is that you don't really have a lot of choice on how to do the inverse. If you have a monoid, there isn't more than one choice of having inverses. So that, that just says a monoid being a group is a property of a monoid. You don't get, it just is, it just happens to be a group and there is no choice as to how it's going to be a group. Uh, the question is, isn't it better to not assume that S is a set and just require a proof that is a set 
Okay, so actually in type theory, if somebody says that S is a set, what they have in mind secretly, when they say I have a set S, what they mean to say is that S, they have S, which is a type together with some unspecified proof that it's a set. So to say that I have a set S, I will have both these ingredients. So then it doesn't really matter. So I think, okay, you should be S. Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, there we go. Okay. So there are lots of these, uh, the phraseology here is, is a bit like category theory, you know, like in category theory, they keep drawing arrows, they don't give them names and it drives you crazy, but they all know what error they mean. It's a bit like that. There's lots of details that I'm hiding, uh, that I'm forgetting to tell you because, uh, well, I'm forgetting to tell you. Okay, but let's, 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 uh, uh, let's contrast this with the structure of a group. So we said whether a monoid is a group is going to be a property of the monoid because you can show that is group S, M, E, A, alpha, namely this sum here, you can show that it's a proposition. That is to say, if you take two of these, then you can show that it's a proposition. And I know that somebody is worrying about function extensionality and yes, there are principles I haven't meant that there's an important principle I haven't mentioned yet called function extensionality, which you would need for that. But the point is that this would be an example of a property that you can understand from ordinary mathematics, because you know from ordinary mathematics that there is just one way for a monoid to be a, to be a group. However, if I say the structure of a group on a set S, well, then what I mean is, I mean the structure of a monoid together with an additional structure of being a group. And of course, now this is going to be a structure because there are many monoid structures on general on an S that I can put here. And then this additional business here is not going to help. Okay, so at the very least, the notion of a set and a property is important because it's going to give us uh, an exact way of distinguishing these things, which are somewhat done somewhat informally in mathematics, namely the difference between a property and a structure. You can make it formal, a la Bourbaki. Here it works in a homotopical way. Let's look at uh, another important concept. Suppose you have a type A and maybe it's not a proposition or maybe it's not a set, but you would like to force it to be a set. Then we should expect there to be some sort of an operation and the homotopy type theory actually gives you a way to define these operations. I'm not going to explain how, because that would be technically demanding, but I just want to offer the following idea that if you have a type, there should be a way of sort of turning it into, turning it into an N type. So type theoretically that you would, that would be a kind of an, it would have to be a kind of operation which takes a type A here and it gives you a new type. And then it gives you a new type, which I'm going to write like this. This is N truncated A, the way you call this N truncated A. And now what else? Well, of course you would need the evidence, which I don't have a good way of writing down anything here. So I'm just saying like, there is some evidence we might call N trunk is N trunk or something A that this really is an n type right so that you know that you landed where you want it to be so there are two there are two parts of this we got the type and it's n type and then also we would expect there to be some connection between the two and the connection is that you have a way of turning anything that's in a into something that's in the truncated type um okay the question there's a question what happens with universes does truncation change the universe that's going to depend a little bit on how you construct the truncations. I think there are some ways in the Unimath library where this is not, it depends on, on the technical details, but there is at least one way that will, uh, that will uh, preserve the universe level. So it will land in the same universe. Is N type a property? Okay, that's, you're starting to ask the correct questions. You see, now you can start asking for a bunch of things, whether they're a property or a structure. For instance, being an N type, is it a property or a structure? Can a type be an N type in many ways? Very good question. Um, I'm not going to reveal the answer. Find it in a book. 
or chat where Egbert is dropping hints. He said, not all, note also that is set is a property. Come on, if is set is a property, then surely is groupoid is a property, right? How bad could it get? So, um, yes, so what we're not so far, you see, we, we want to say that something nice happens, not just that we are making a type, we're forcing a type to be an n type. What does this mean? Well, we need to somehow trivialize higher, we need to trivialize all identity paths of uh, dimension of above dimension n to make an n type. Uh, so what we have to do that in a good way. Well, but category theory knows how to say, how to say that, right? This construction has to be universal. So a category theorist would say, well, what you're saying is that this arrow that you give yourself from A to the truncation is universal in the sense that every map from A to an N type will factor through it, will factor through it uniquely. Right now, we really lack a good way of expressing this. We could express this in terms of, you know, inference rules and stuff, but we'll later see a better way to do it with equivalences. But I'm just noting that we're not done describing what truncation is. So instead, I'm just going to say some, what are some special cases of interest and show you pretty pictures, okay? So here. So a special case of interest is set truncation, which truncates a set, forces something to be a set. So what does that mean? That means it's going to uh, make sure that all, that there is nothing interesting going on in the identity, in the identity types. Um, and uh, here is a picture. Uh, no, oh, oops, error. This is what I was asking earlier. This, I think, needs to be contractible. So, but let's just focus on this picture. So, if this is A, okay, how do you make, how do you force it to be a set? You see, right now it's not a set because it has these funny loops. And these funny loops are going to be, this loop here is not going to be the same as the identity path on this point. So I have a point B here. So this loop going around twice is not the same as going around once. You know, they're just, I'm just speaking, I'm just relying on your intuition here. So not, I'm not doing anything formal. So this is a problem. And what the set truncation does is it connects everybody with everybody. It just drops in lots of paths. In, in homotopy type theory, whenever you feel the urge, to glue things together, you don't. You always put a path in between instead. Never ever glue anything, always just use paths to connect things. So you put in a bunch of type, a bunch of things, and then you get boring connectedness components. Each one looks like each one is each one is contractible here. And then if you do propositional truncation, then you connect everything. So you just get a blob like that, and it's very boring. So all you know now is that there was something in the original type, but you have no idea what it was. Okay, what is this used for? Ooh, I'm running over time here. So um, the proposition on truncation is our way to logic. Uh, so question is, what does, what does minus two look like? Ah, okay, what is truncation to minus two? Uh, the minus second truncation is even more boring because it always just returns a contractible type, like it just always gives you the unit type. That's it. So it's 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 the minus two truncation of the empty set is it's always the same answer. It's always the unit type. That's why I didn't draw it. It's always just the unit type. Okay, so we will use the propositional truncation to be able to differentiate between the two senses in which things can be true that Violetta was asking about, where you care or you don't care about in how many ways things can be true. In particular, we can define logic this way. We already said that true is like one and false, you know, true one is like true and false is zero, but we can go on. And in, in intuitionistic logic, we say, well, negation is just an abbreviation for P implies false and then if you ever heard of Curry Howard isomorphism, this will be convenient, this will be familiar. How do, you know, what is the evidence of P and Q? You give an ordered pair, evidence of P and evidence of Q, and you can keep going. However, when you get to or, you would want to use plus, which we didn't discuss. This is just disjoint sum of two types. 
but this is not in general going to be a proposition. Uh, so you don't want to use necessarily this if you stick to the idea that uh, truth values must be propositions, so must have at most one point. You would hear you would hit this with the minor, with the truncation, and you would then go back. You would get you would get back to propositions, and you have to do it also for exists. And um, caveat: I am using something called function extensionality, which we will address very soon. And the reason we, we need function extensionality here is to show that implication and pi preserve propositions. But that's a technicality you don't need to join, uh, worry about right now. The point is that we have truncations, they have a universal property which we haven't stated yet, and we can use them now to get back to logic. See? So logic is now seen as one level of type theory. Okay. So, um, why is this important? Because it allows us to uh, express things like uh, surjection versus retraction. Let me just do one because I'm running a little bit late. So we can express we can express um, loop space versus fundamental group. A loop space based at A is just the identity type A equals A because these are just these are literally the space of loops which begin in A and end in A. But that's not what a fundamental group is. If you open a book about uh, homotopy theory, they will say that the fundamental group is a quotient of this thing. Essentially, you just want the connectedness components of this space, which is then precisely just the truncation, the set truncation. And so that's how you can get to things like fundamental group. And there are many other uses of truncation. So I would like to um, finish with a picture here, this session, of what uh, now we, the way that you can think of this, okay? So first, there is one dimension of size, which is the universes. You have a universe, and then you have a bigger universe, and you have a bigger universe, and you have a bigger universe. And so this is the direction in which you get ever more larger types. But there is another direction in homotopy type theory, which is about is not about size, it's about the complexity of the identity types. It's the, about the complexity of the structure. So first we have the contractible types, which are, to be honest, pretty boring. There's lots of them, of course, but they're all, you know, this more or less, they're all just the unit type. Then there are propositions. So it goes in a different direction, which are the, so these are minus two types, minus two types, minus one types, zero types, one types, and so on. So there is a homotopy level. Um, you will hear home. You will hear people who work in hot as describing these levels: the levels minus one, minus minus two, minus one, and zero. Everything up to including to level zero as set level mathematics. Why? Because it's logic plus sets. You see, contractible is boring, so it includes logic propositions and sets, and that's how uh, set theory is done, right? So set theory is logic plus sets, and then there is all of this stuff up here which I think uh, when, when you, you will see during this week that there's lots of interesting structure here as well. Okay, time for exercises. As, as, as we discovered, it's, you should count its success to understand uh, the exercises. Um, and uh, these are exercises showing that something, so this one is showing, the first one says, if A is contractible, then it's a proposition, because if A is contractible, then, um, it's, uh, then its, its identity types are contractible. So it's just saying contractible type is a proposition. But maybe this is good to actually write down what's going on with your bare hands. Um, the chat already answered in general the second question, which here is just is contractibility a property or a structure. And then there is another exercise about contractibility that you might want to do one day because it's actually pretty important. Pretty important. 